you have a prepaid call from an inmate at California Substance Abuse Treatment Facility and State Prison at Corcoran in Corcoran, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using... Hey, how are you doing? What's up? How you got? Oh, I'm doing great. How about yourself? Uh, not bad, bro. Um, I told you I'd call you one of these days, so uh, we could see if we could uh, get this, you know? Oh, sure. Okay, yeah, well, um, I'm looking for pen pals, females to talk to, um, you know, meet new people, have interesting conversations. Um, you know, if you like, if you like my picture, uh, you can write me on my JPEG tablet. Uh, you can write me letters. I'll always respond back. And, um, yeah, I just like to meet new people and, you know, have interesting, open, honest dialogue and good conversations with people. Okay, if it's okay with you, since we're doing gang prevention and the youth, they have certain questions that might want to reach out to you um, and, and, and yeah. um, have advice. Is it okay they write you to and other individuals regarding what age they are? With it be male or female? Um, yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so, what's your nationality? I'm Armenian. Were you ever part of any gangs, groups, or organizations? No. Were you from out here in the streets? Um, originally, I'm born in Armenia. I've lived in Los Angeles. I've lived in New York originally when I was really, really young. That's where we first moved to. Um, I lived in Fresno. I uh, My last place I lived was Sacramento, California. That's where I caught my case. Okay. Um, what did they call you and what, or what you go by? I just go by V. Let me ask you this. You mentioned you were uh, out there in Hollywood or, or uh, lived there for a certain amount of time. Let me ask you this. I know they got a large population of Armenians there, and they actually are Southsiders for Armenian power. So my question yeah. to you is, do you, uh, were you, are you associate them, or, or do you run with Southsiders or Nathaniels when you were at the main line? No, I don't. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Uh, dudes, for the guys from Armenian power, they usually run with Southsiders and on the main line, and that's because, you know, they... They're from down south, Los Angeles, and I'm not from down south. You know, when I was a teenager, I was around mostly northerners from northern California. So that's, you know, that was my crowd. That was, you know, the people I grew up with and the people that I was around. Okay. Can you elaborate um, briefly on um, your childhood and how you were raised? And what kind of family came from and uh, stuff like that? I'm sorry, go my ahead. Childhood was, my childhood wasn't the best. I mean, um, I grew up, you know, with three sisters and my mom. My dad was really, really abusive towards my mom and my sisters. Um, you know, I witnessed a lot of stuff from him. I always, you know, hitting my mom, degrading my mom, cheating on my mom. Um, uh, physical abuse, emotional abuse, uh, controlling her, controlling my sisters, always trying to like control me, have, you know, what we can and can't do, what we could wear, uh, just, you know, it was uh, really difficult, but that's all I kind of knew at the time, and it got to a point where, you know, it got really, really hard, and, you know, my mom tried to leave. He didn't want to let her divorce. He didn't want to let her leave. And then I was already living on my own at the time. And my mom and my sisters had to escape from his house and come to my house and stay with me. And that's when he came and tried to, you know, start fights with them and start fights with me. And it just got to a point, man, where, you know, uh, I ended up killing my dad because of everything he did to my mom and it wasn't like out of revenge or anything like that it was just more um like a basic need just for survival for my mom to you know to be okay and to be okay without him and so he stopped putting his hands on her and he doesn't kill her he had a saying like he always said that he was gonna kill my mom and bury her in the backyard you know he used to always say that and you know i really believe that it was going to come down to it that last time she ran away from home from him and you know, that's what ended up happening, and that's why I'm in prison. 
Okay, can you uh, briefly, um, because of time restraints, um, give us a brief summary on what you went through in trial. Did you take a plea deal or did you, um, you know, take a trial and loss? And how, what, yeah. how, how, what, what amount of time was your sentence? Well, I didn't take a plea deal because one wasn't offered. But in my trial, um, I pretty much went to trial. I, had, I, I testified on my own defense. My mom and my sisters testified on my own defense. I had a great doctor who uh, her expertise is um, intimate partner battering syndrome, formerly known as battered woman syndrome. She testified in my defense, you know, saying, um, you know, pretty much um, what she could, you know, say on the stand as far as, like, what she believed happened. And, you know, she interviewed me for a long, lengthy, lengthy time, you know, six, seven hours every few days for several weeks and got to know me and my childhood and my family, my sisters. And pretty much the gist of it on my case was, my lawyer was very inexperienced and incompetent and argued diminished capacity defense, which is pretty much in California known as a tricky defense, and it's for people who, you know, are drunk in a bar and, uh, you know, punch and kill somebody, and their diminished capacity, so meaning they're, you know, not in the right state of mind. That's the argument he used in my trial instead of an available California law for manslaughter, which is imperfect self-defense. And had he argued that in front of the judge, I would have ended up getting manslaughter instructions and it would have allowed my jury to consider manslaughter for me, which they didn't. They wanted to. It took three days for them to deliberate on my case with me getting on the stand and confessing to everything, saying I did do it, but I was protecting my mom and my sisters. And pretty much I ended up getting first found guilty of first degree murder, um, and I got life without. How long have you been incarcerated? Um, going on 16 years now. What do you have to say to, um, what message would you have to say because there's cases and treating cases, you know, you're defending your mother and stuff like that, right? Um, so, I mean, you have to do what you have to do, you know, because, you know, he threatened your mom and you thought that was going to, you know, actually he, he was going to do that, right? So, uh, what message do you have to the youngsters or the youth out here that, you know, might be uh, troubled and, and, you know, on drugs or, you know, I mean, just, you know, living a certain lifestyle that, you know, that's maybe... Uh, destructive. Well, for me, like anybody, like I wish I could go back and change what I did, of course, and seek help. You know, I wish I could have seek somebody, uh, somebody uh, wise enough to help me and give me guidance and lead me, you know, to the right decisions I could have made. I, I made wrong decisions completely wrong. I wasn't even thinking about, like, what if I get caught and go to jail or go to prison. That wasn't even on my mind. I was so, you know, hopeless and, you know, um, like, I wanted to protect my mom and that's all that mattered to me and you know for anybody that you know is going through stuff like that with their family or they're being abused or you know they just need somebody they need a good role model in their life somebody they could talk to somebody that could help them out and um, i didn't have that you know had i had that things would have been a lot different for me and i could have seeked help but i had nowhere to turn to my dad that I thought I could like, you know, I was fighting against my dad, you know, like the one person that's supposed to love me and I could go to help and he wasn't there for me. And I was, you know, the battle was against him. So my mom was naive and scared of him and my sisters were scared. Everyone was always like scared and upset and crying and like, you know, so as a kid, a 19 year old kid, you know, the only hope in my mind, or the only thought in my mind was, okay, well, you know, I have to make sure that my mom wakes up without him, you know, and without him hitting my mom every single day, you know, and it's the wrong thing to do, but that's like, I felt like that was the only option left for me. I couldn't go to the police because the police, you know, wouldn't believe it. Every time the police would come to the house, um, he would deny it and he would make my mom deny it that nothing happened. It was just a mistake or she was just upset, you know, so you just need guidance, man. Somebody to speak to and somebody to put them a beat in a role model. Okay, I don't have any more questions for you, bro, but do you have anything else to address or add? Um, besides that, not really. I mean, you know, 
I'm just hoping for the best to happen. There's lots to change in here for me to have, I have an opportunity to go to parole board. And, you know, the LWAP system, the LWAP sense is very harsh in here for majority of us. And the only ones that have action that given out on L, under LWAP is, you know, actual juveniles under 17 years old. And, you know, if you're under between the age of 18 and 25 years old, and you don't have LWAP, you're actually considered a youth offender unless you're sentenced to LWAP. And it's like, you know, the youth offender system, you know, it's, it's for, you know, teenagers out there who, you know, have all the hallmarks of youth, aren't fully mature. Their brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 26. So it's like, you know, kids out there can't make the right decisions. And this is a scientific law now. And our senators and congressmen are, are hip to it already. and. They're coming out with new laws and new bills to be able to, you know, give teenagers that are in prison with, you know, ridiculous amounts of time, 75 to life or any, anything without a reasonable date to get out for them to go to parole board. Everybody except their wops. So, you know, I just want to get a little support for, you know, all of us in here doing LWAP to get a chance to go to parole board. You know, it's not a guaranteed release date, but it is. Uh, opportunity for us to go to board and let the let the parole board decide whether we've earned our you know earned our way out and we could go home now to our families. We have loved ones out there that want us home too, you know. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Okay, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. If you would like to write support letters, you know, um, just in case you go support um, parole board, um, please do so. You have 60 seconds remaining. Would you like to give a shout out to any family and friends out here? before these things cuts off? Um, yeah, I send my love and respect to everybody out there and, you know, everybody who supported me all these years. I love them. I appreciate everything, and that's about it.